With the exception of Mayor Pro Tem Rosansky and Council Members Daigle and Nichols, uh, all Council Members are present. Mr. Mayor, at the last study session, we had a report on the Upper Bay dredging project, and out of that presentation came a request from the City Council, I think it was Councilman Nichols, that wanted uh, a similar type of report in scope uh, about the Lower Bay. So Tom Ross Miller is going to provide that. Thank you, Homer. Mayor Webb, Council Members, um, a few weeks ago I told you about the Upper Bay dredging project, and uh, so uh, I thought I'd uh, give you some more detail about um, the lower bay dredging and um, a lot of related topics. Um, what I'd like to talk about this evening is uh, started out with uh, why we really need to do dredging in the lower bay, give you a short historical perspective of um, dredging in the bay, um, talk to you a bit about the comprehensive sediment management program that we've developed with our partners in the watershed, and then uh, talk about a proposed lower dra bay dredging project that we're working on with the Army Corps of Engineers and a strategy to get it funded. And uh, also to tell you about a grant that we've um, received for uh, development of a harbor area management plan that also addresses uh, some of the eelgrass issues that we're uh, dealing with here in the harbor. Um, talk about the uh, renewal of our regional general permit and, um, and of course, um, lastly, the Balboa Island Beach Replenishment Project that's uh, under preparation right now. Next. Well, to start it off, um, do we really need to dredge? It, this is a relatively small sailboat um, in the main channel, and it's, it's hard of ground. Um, and it shows that certainly the main navigation channel um, needs to be dredged, and uh, that there certainly are safety issues here in the harbor that need to be addressed. In fact, the Army Corps of Engineers survey estimates that we have um, over 900,000 cubic yards of sediment that's above design grade in the harbor that needs to be removed. Um, I might add that um, the harbor was never actually fully dredged to the Army Corps of Engineers design uh, standards, but, uh, but uh, that's what we're measuring too. Does yeah. that uh, 900,000 yards include the channel all the way out to the end of the jetty, or is that just the turning basin, or? It's uh, the entire uh, Lower Bay Federal Navigation uh, channel areas that is from um, project line to project line, not just the channels, but uh, under the moorings also. Mm, okay. And Tom, how does that 900,000 cubic yards compare with uh, what they're going to dredge out of the upper bay? In the upper bay, we're going to remove about 2.1 million cubic yards. Next slide. Um, to go back in time, um, it all started in about 1919 when the city and the county uh, developed plans to improve the navigability of the harbor. Um, the, um, this plan sheet from 1919 shows a project that was proposed that would build a dam at uh, Bitter Point, which is um, about where Cappy's Restaurant is today. Um, build a new outlet for the Santa Ana River that goes straight out instead of meand meandering through the lower bay, and uh, dredge the main channel, which is referred to as the county channel back in those days, the city channel being this channel uh, right here along the peninsula, and extend uh, the entrance jetty. Next slide. Um, of course, like today, they had trouble funding such a project. They were looking for a half a million dollars, and they passed out this handbill, and uh, they convinced the voters, or the voters to uh, vote yes on um, 
the um, bond issue um, with the hopes to uh, get commerce into the harbor. The commerce never happened for a lot of reasons uh, that the mayor can share with us. He's an expert with those that historical perspective, but I won't go into that right now. Next slide. Um, so um, the dredging timeline was uh, really started with uh, private developers in 1906 who spent about $470,000 in the Lower Bay um, developing some of the islands um, between 1906 and 1920. The city of Newport Beach spent uh, $450,000 in 1916 on improvement that um, included dredging that city channel that I showed on the last slide. And then um, that bond issue was passed in 1919 uh, where they uh, picked up uh, a half a million dollars plus about $85,000 from the sale of some of the dredge material. Um, and then the real dredging really started um, after the passing of that bond issue between 1919 and 1930, uh, about a million two hundred thousand cubic yards were dredged from the lower bay and placed on the Balboa Peninsula. Then there was another big rush of dredging between 33 and 35 that placed uh, another million one hundred thousand um, on the in, at West Newport and came out of the lower bay. The important thing to note here is that. Um, this material was all really nice sandy material that came from the Santa Ana River. And um, the pesky old harbor entrance, which caused grief for decades, had to be dredged yet again in 1935. You'll notice that there was no maintenance dredging until 1981 because the Santa Ana River, as I had mentioned earlier, was diverted out of the harbor. San Diego Creek did not flow into the harbor at this point. And again, the harbor entrance needed to be dredged. In uh, 1998, um, following the disastrous winter of 97, where uh, a, the federal government and the state declared um, Orange County a disaster area, we got the Army Corps of Engineers to come into Newport Bay um, on an emergency cleanup to clean up um, what's called the Upper Bay Channel uh, between Linda Isle, Bay Shores, and Harbor Island, and a portion of the main channel here to the tune of about 164,000 cubic yards. Uh, they did that as an emergency project. And then lastly in the timeline, in uh, just a couple of years ago in 03, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers dredged about 43,000 cubic yards from uh, the entrance channel, Corona Del Mar Bend, uh, the east side of Balboa Island and uh, adjacent to Collins Isle. I thought I should add into the timeline uh, some dredging not relative to the main channel. It um, is relative to the regional general permit, uh, which allows up to about 20,000 cubic yards per year of dredging between the bulkhead and the pierhead lines. That dredging is the responsibility of the property owner, and, um, and it's pretty significant when you look at the numbers. Um, since 1976, when we um, started keeping records of, of the regional general permit work, um, there was about 170,000 cubic yards of material that was dredged and disposed at LA-3 and then another 187,000 cubic yards that was dredged and placed on in-bay beaches. So um, what history told us was um, the river made a big impact uh, on Lower Newport Bay prior to 1920, putting a lot of nice sand uh, in, in the harbor, which was later used um, to build the islands and to build our, our beaches on the peninsula in West Newport. Um, the harbor entrance um, continually to this day gets uh, sand from the littor littoral zone um, into the harbor entrance to the tune of about 15,000 cubic yards a year as an annual average um, and needs to be cleaned out. Um, 
And until 1969, uh, that disastrous flood, um, San Diego Creek did not flow into um, the upper bay and the lower bay. And uh, San Diego Creek watershed is quite different than the Santa Ana River. Um, it doesn't provide us with any sand. It provides us with a lot of silt and clay load. And, um, and unfortunately, that kind of material does not have a beneficial reuse in the harbor and needs to be removed and uh, taken to the ocean disposal, disposal site at a significant cost. Um, now that I've talked about some history, I thought I should tell you about uh, um, the fact that all of that maintenance um, is really a, not a lot of benefit to the Bay without a very comprehensive uh, program uh, with our watershed partners that includes source control. And we've been working with our partners on doing things like um, building uh, foothill um, debris and sediment control basins. About nine out of the 13 that have been planned have been constructed. Um, we've been doing agricultural best management practice implementation in the watershed on the ag land that's still left. Um, channel stabilization is a huge thing. Right now, most of the sediment that comes into the upper bay comes from stream bank and bottom erosion. And um, our um, Watershed partners up in the Lake Forest area um, at Serrano Creek is one of the biggest sources of sediment erosion that comes into the bay and that we're working on trying to uh, solve that issue right now. Um, we also constructed three in-channel sediment control basins um, in San Diego Creek um, to collect the coarser material before it gets into the upper bay. and. Um, and then the in-bay basins collect the fine grain sediment um, before it uh, travels down into the lower bay. The in-bay basins have been full for a number of years. We're actually in violation of the sediment TMDL with the Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, because those basins are full. And uh, the upper bay project that I told you about last time is uh, going to correct that situation. And then um, I should also mention that um, construction site um, best management practices to control um, sediment is also an important part of the program. Next slide. Um, we worked with our partners, and you can see a long list of them um, in this 10-year-old uh, fact sheet, um, to, uh, to do a lot of those projects in the upper bay to uh, control sediment. and. Um, they included um, several dredging projects, both in San Diego Creek um, and in the Upper Bay. And um, best management practices on agricultural and developing properties, uh, flood control improvements, channel stabilization. And the bottom line is that um, um, we've spent about $145 million in the watershed um, trying to con control sediment from getting into the bay. Um, Ten years ago, we were, we were starting to build an annuity um, to um, uh, fund future maintenance of uh, in-bay projects. And um, the only deposit we've had in that annuity is about $3.8 million in the Skinner-Robinson Fund, which um, was derived from the American Trader incident. Um, I, I thought for our viewing audience, I'd, I should also talk about where does all that sediment go. We're talking millions of cubic yards. And um, if it's greater than 80% sand, um, we're required to try and use it on a local beach. It, of course, has to meet certain quality criteria, um, but, but the first uh, screening uh, mechanism that we look at is the grain size. If it's less than 80% sand, it, it goes out for ocean disposal. We're working statewide with Department of Boating Waterways to get that standard uh, relaxed so that we can have more beneficial reuse of sand, um, putting it in a nearshore zone and letting the ocean waves sort it out and bring the coarse material 
on to the shoreline and the finer material gets winnowed further offshore is, is uh, what we're trying to achieve on a lot of projects. A lot of folks have asked us, where is LA-3? Here's the harbor entrance, um, and it's about four nautical miles out into the Newport Submarine Canyon. Up until um, just this January, we used the interim site, um, and um, we hired U.S. Geological Survey to, um, to do a bathymetric study out in the Newport Submarine Canyon to um, tell us what the canyon looks like. Uh, you can see there's several deep arms of the canyon, and when we developed this site three decades ago, we tried to get it out into this flatter uh, alluvial plain out here rather than in uh, the canyon. So, so we moved this site to uh, better fit those criteria. I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but I just wanted to show that LA-3 has been used every year since 1976, and it's typically used for that regional general permit small quantities um, interspersed with some large clean-out quantities, like in 87 of a, about 1.2 million cubic yards from, from uh, big projects in the upper bay. Next slide. So. Um, that brings us to this uh, new project that we're uh, trying to develop with the Army Corps of Engineers. We've um, looked at a condition survey of the entire harbor that the Army Corps did, um, this entire area in between these dotted lines um, is the area that the Corps has uh, responsibility for in dredging, and um, we found based on uh, reviewing their survey results that this area outlined in red was our highest priority for removing sediment. The project that is defined by dredging the main channel to minus 15 and uh, side channels and the anchorage to minus 12 is about 400,000 cubic yards. Not all of that 900,000 cubic yards, but enough to give us uh, safe navigation in the channel. Um, we're estimating that that's about a, a $4 million project. Um, I'm going to have Larry Paul come up and talk to you about um, some more details of this project and, and our strategy that we developed. Mayor Webb and council members, I'm Larry Paul. I'm a consultant for the city, and I'd like this opportunity to just kind of talk to you briefly about uh, putting together this uh, federal strategy for Lower Newport Bay dredging. Uh, recently, we had a meeting here at the city with um, the Corps of Engineers District Commander, Colonel Alex Dornstadter, and his staff to talk about this very issue. How can we put the pieces together on this? They informed us, and we already knew, there was no federal money is currently available, and that this um, first phase of the project, the original uh, lower bay dredging that was started by the Corps hit a snag with this testing protocol that the city went ahead and took, uh, took uh, head on and resolved that protocol, that testing protocol issue. The Colonel and his staff uh, expressed a, a very strong willingness to help us in implementing this strategy, which we think can happen in 07. Um, basically, the next slide will kind of cover our overarching strategy and the logic behind it. Uh, the federal channel was, was partially dredged in 03, and the project was discontinued because of this sediment contamination issue, which has now been resolved. The uh, residual federal funding for this, and they call it an operation and maintenance project, it's, an, it's their funding source. Uh, when they stop a project or a project can't go Further, there's, if with the existing funding for that project, they shift it or reprogram it to another project within the the region, say California, and uh, so that that what had taken place in this case. The Upper Bay dredging is the Upper Newport Bay dredging is scheduled to begin, like it already has, I think. In some cases, they got the the, the dredge in place already. 
The dredging contractor is on site for the project and will remain on site for the project for about two years. That's the length of this particular upper bay dredging. The lower bay needs to be dredged and we were going to continue with our federal dredge, pushing the federal dredging responsibilities to eliminate the existing shoaling that is a hazard to navigation. Then, as Tom mentioned, the project cost for the Corps to do this continued or, or interrupted project is about $4 million. Now, what was presented to the Colonel and his staff members and also subsequently was, was presented to the division, which is in San Francisco, and also was presented to um, one of the headquarters uh, chief uh, civilians for the U.S. Army Corps headquarters in Washington, D.C. when he came out here, was that. This project is $4 million. If you have um, a, a dredging operation underway, federal dredging operation underway in the upper bay, there is no need for mobilization, which comes at a pro price tag of approximately $1 million. Um, if the city was in a position to contribute uh, uh, some additional funding, the, with, the, with the above, the federal cost could be reduced to $2 million. That would complete a $4 million project with savings and participation. The Lower Bay is, as Tom mentioned, is a component of the larger comprehensive watershed approach currently underway. And with the, the, with the completion of the lower bay dredging and with the upper bay dredging, uh, the channel maintenance, federal channel maintenance, is, is probably not going to be needed for the, for the next 20 years. This is based on the upper bay economic studies on that. So the bottom line is for the core to continue uh, their project valued at approximately $4 million if we can find a way of getting it done for $2 million on their part. We, we feel very positive that we could come up with a reprogramming effort through the Corps' process toward the end of this fiscal year in order to get this project underway. Thank you. How many uh, cubic yards is in the red area for this project? Approximately 400,000 cubic yards. And Larry, when you say the fiscal year then, is that about October time frame? Well, actually, the strategy includes reprogramming, so that would be for fiscal year, federal fiscal year 06, if that's possible. The city's congressional request also asks for $4 million for 07. So we're hedging our bets. We're asking for it twice. Once as a reprogram, but for 06, if that doesn't happen, then, uh, then in 07. But the city's fiscal year is different than the federal fiscal year. That's correct. Year. So, so what is the time? When does the fiscal year start? They're, fiscal, they're in their 06 fiscal year right now, which ends on September 30. I also mentioned in the beginning that um, I wanted to talk about the regional general permit renewal because it is an important part of uh, that comprehensive dredging um, project for the Lower Bay, and it's something that we're um, deeply involved in right now. And, um, and dip, try and differentiate between the Army Corps of Engineers dredging of the main navigation channels and um, a regional general permit dredging, which allows dredging between the pierhead and bulkhead lines uh, under and adjacent to um, the docks that are in the city. Um, the city um, is also in our application for a regional general permit asking for um, coverage of dock construction projects that, um, and repair projects that um, essentially redo docks to uh, the new standards that we'll be bringing before the council in a few weeks. Um, it, it really is a, a great process for our property owners in the city in that um, they come to us to get a permit to dredge. Um, we um, put together um, some information that the agencies require like uh, uh, Calerpa eelgrass surveys and grain size analysis uh, that um, the property owner provides and um, 
we put all the paperwork through to, uh, to the resource agencies, um, saving um, the property owners a, a lot of time, money, and frustration because they don't have to do some additional uh, chemical analyses work and, and, um, and hire consultants to, uh, to uh, process permits um, through the individual permit process, which um, can take um, six months to uh, two years sometimes to, to get through. So um, the, the process, um, although not perfect, certainly has um, shortened the time frame. Um, we've had some come through in as short as a month, but the typical uh, permit turns around in three to six months. And, and um, the um, Coastal Commission staff uh, in our recent negotiations has told us that they're going to um, work hard to keep that turnaround at a month, that, well, which they have been able to do a few times in the past. Next slide. Um, our regional general permit um, did expire, and um, all projects that um, were permitted under it were required to be completed by January 24th, um, just about a month ago. Um, we've been working on the renewal process for about two years, and we finally overcome most of the major obstacles. Um, one of the the major obstacles was um, the presence of um, some pollutants like uh, DDT um, in the sediments in the harbor. And um, so we had to go through um, some bioassay and bioaccumulation tests uh, to show that the levels were not critical enough to, um, to cause problems when they were dredged or during the dredging process or when they're deposited out at the LA-3 uh, disposal site or when they were reused at beaches in the harbor. Um, that process um, was quite difficult. We actually even had to develop a, a new method for amp amphipod uh, survival testing, um, which was finally accepted by EPA. And, um, and in fact, they helped us ensure that all the other agencies um, accepted it also. Um, the uh, renegotiated uh, regional general permit um, has been approved by the agencies in principle. Some of the uh, details that um, we're still putting together is that uh, NOAA Fisheries has agreed to um, write a detailed procedure um, for the eelgrass divers and the dredgers so that they'll understand the process that we have to undergo about um, uh, changes in the monitoring protocol. Next slide, please. Um, we um, are also, as I mentioned earlier, getting the Coastal Commission staff on board with us to, um, to shorten the process and um, to um, allow for dock construction um, that comply with our standards. The Regional Water Quality Control Board has also agreed to issue us a programmatic 401 certification for the project. And, um, and there's a few projects in the harbor that um, have more than 500 cubic yards of sand that could be beneficially reused. And, We've convinced the agencies to increase our allowance to 1,000 cubic yards for those kinds of projects. Um, we, we're working on the formal submittal of um, our application to the agencies, even though we've negotiated all the terms of, uh, of the agreements. And, uh, and we think um, that all of the uh, boards and commissions that have to approve the deals that we've made with staff uh, will uh, do their job by the end of April. Um, an important part of those negotiations um, has been uh, that of the potential damage to eelgrass habitat during the dredging process. Um, there was a number of agencies that felt 
uh, that um, we couldn't do precision dredging. This particular slide in the background shows uh, one of the local dredgers um, dredging ar around an eelgrass bed um, where they um, got as close as three feet from an eelgrass bed on one side and, and 13 feet on another side and, and were able to um, dredge it without any loss of the eelgrass. Um, and so we demonstrated to them that, that we could do it and we could maintain this harbor um, with, without causing um, problems with an important habitat. Um, also, as part of that eelgrass program, um, we have applied for and received a grant um, to develop a harbor uh, area management plan. We refer to that as a HAMP. Um, and we're trying to develop that to ensure that um, all the beneficial uses in the harbor that includes swimming, boating, uh, safe navigation, um, are not lost at the expense of another one, like eelgrass. Um, so we're trying to balance the beneficial uses of the harbor, and, and we've got all the resources agencies to uh, buy into that general concept. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, they are going to uh, provide us a lot of support in putting together the HAMP. Next slide. Tom, can I ask you a question? It sure. seems to me like a catch-22 situation. The more silt that comes into the lower bay, the lower the water level, and probably the more, the easier it is for eelgrass to grow because it needs that sunlight. So then once it grows, are you going to ever be able to uh, reclaim it again by dredging it? Um, that's correct. That The eelgrass prefers growing in a depth of about minus 2 to minus 8, mean low or low water. and uh, as that sediment uh, develops um, in that range, um, it does give, um, promotes eelgrass growth. Um, and, and that's a, a good question leading a perfect segue into this slide is that we've monitored where eelgrass is growing and we're gonna, we have in the budget to do additional monitoring um, because what we'd like to do is develop um, a baseline of eelgrass. Um, and that baseline will take um, into consideration the, the high years and the low years. The, um, this last year we lost about half of all the eelgrass shown in this slide from 2004. And, um, and when we establish that baseline, we'll be able to define um, what's required to keep the essential fish habitat in the harbor. Um, and, um, and I've thrown out a number to the agencies that um, I think 25 acres is um, a, a good baseline for that essential fish habitat. And uh, right here what we're showing is about 140 acres of eelgrass. So um, what we're going to try and do with the hemp is uh, if we have over 25 acres of eelgrass or whatever number we settle on, um, we'll be allowed to do maintenance dredging projects without mitigating for it. So, so that's the strategy in, in developing this project. Tom, how did you come up with the 25 acre number? Um, for uh, several decades, um, there were um, eelgrass range from four to 25 acres um, in the lower bay um, with very poor water quality conditions and the fish habitat um, survived through that uh, time period. Um, and so we just took the upper end number and said, <coughs> you know, that's, that's what made it through our bad times with uh, really bad water quality. Now that we've improved water quality and, and have been able to demonstrate that we can grow more, I think we can sustain that um, with existing conditions. Thank you. I thought I'd throw in a slide for another form of dredging um, that we practice here in the harbor, and that's pushing up sand from the low tide line 
up to create a, a larger dry beach. Um, wind and wave erosion and a lot of people, people traffic um, on our public beaches, especially around Balboa Island, um, cause the sand to slough off into the bay. Um, we're working with uh, Councilman Selich and uh, the BIIA members uh, to select seven locations, which you see in this slide, um, where we'll be pushing that sand back up um, onto the beach. We don't um, want to add new sand into these areas because um, it, it'll uh, fill in some of the uh, slip, adjacent slip areas, and we, we don't want to uh, cause problems with safe navigation. But we, we do want to balance uh, safe navigation with um, recreational use of our beaches. Um, and, and that's going to be part of that HAMP study, too, uh, developing that balance. We also, um, in um, working with our dredging problems in the harbor, try to take um, as, find as much opportunistic sand in the harbor as we can. Um, at this location, Channel Reef, in the entrance channel, you can see that um, sand is accumulated under these docks to the point that they're not usable. Um, we have been working with that homeowners association in trying to uh, put together a project where we would take some of the sand and use it um, on other beaches, such as um, uh, North Bayfront and Balboa Island, where there are no um, docks to cause adjacency problems or on uh, the uh, down coast end of Corona Del Mar um, Beach um, to um, replenish a very low uh, and narrow beach um, over on our ocean front. Um, so uh, I think um, partnering with um, local residential communities and whatever other sources of sand we can find, and, and there are others in the harbor, is, uh, is a really good approach to solving a lot of our problems. So, final slide. Um, we, we've been um, working on the Upper Newport Bay Ecosystem, Ecosystem Restoration Project, and as you heard last time, um, it's a very important part of our comprehensive sediment management program, but it's only partially funded. Um, further funding uh, of this project is not in the President's budget. Um, th this first phase of the project started with $16 million. The Corps has requested an additional $18 million. They think that's their capability for FY07. And we've got a, a, a big goose egg in the President's budget. So um, we've requested Senator Feinstein um, to help us with a congressional add uh, to the federal budget. And so we're asking um, the council members and the general public to help us um, to provide her and the Energy and Water Appropriations Committee members with letters uh, indicating your support for uh, continued funding of that Upper Bay project and um, to uh, reprogram uh, funding of the maintenance project in the federal areas of the Lower Bay. And uh, that's my presentation. Thank you, Tom. Are there any questions for this again? Sure. Uh, Mr. Selich. <clears throat> um, you indicated the areas where the uh, federal channels are that I guess the federal government and the city in some combination are responsible for, and then the uh, the regional general permit, which I guess covers the areas between the pier head lines back to the bulkhead lines for for the uh, residential properties and the commercial properties. But aren't there other areas of the bay that need to be dredged too? Like I'm thinking like the center of Linda Isle that's outside the uh, the pier head line and who, who's responsible for those areas and you know where maybe you can highlight where those areas are. Sure. Could you take me back to the center of Linda Isle? Um, the center that's, of that's my understanding. Yeah, 
The center of Linda Isle is actually the responsibility of the Linda Isle Homeowners Association. It's actually a private waterway. Um, there um, are other areas of private waterway, the outside of the horseshoe at Linda Isle on these two sides, um, the north and the east side, are also private waterway belonging to the Irvine Company that is their responsible responsibility to dredge. Um, Promontory uh, Bay is, is a private waterway. A again, um, not uh, city responsibility to dredge. Um, this area right in here on the south side of uh, Linda Isle is actually uh, county tidelands and it is their responsibility to dredge and, and they've recently performed a hydrographic survey of that area trying to put together a project. Um, Newport Dunes is county tidelands and their responsibility to dredge. So there's, there's quite a mixed bag. Um, in the lower bay in general though, um, about 16 to 20 feet bayward of the pierhead line is what the Army Corps calls their project line. And uh, that's from project line to project <coughs> line within the harbor is in general in the lower bay, the Army Corps' responsibility. So do those, uh, any of those private areas, they have to go get their own permit? They don't fall under our regional general permit? They have to go and do the long two-year process, or whatever it is? Um, some of them, because of uh, quantities, um, like the dunes, typically when they do a dredging project, it's close to 100,000 cubic yards. So it obviously mm -hmm. doesn't uh, fit within our uh, quantity uh, criteria they do have to do an individual permit and the Army and the county is processing an individual permit for that right now. Um, we've um, talked to um, the Linda Isle Homeowners Association about doing um, up to uh, 500 cubic yards because that's what our previous permit has had, um, dredging at a time and, and just biting away at it a little bit at a time. <coughs> at a time. So. Um, we've also had that conversation with the Channel Reef Homeowners Association, and uh, Mark Seitz uh, recently did two 500-yard uh, projects for Channel Reef. So, um, so there's ways to um, do it within the regional general permit, and then if the quantities get too large, they have to go out for an individual permit. Okay. Then you mentioned uh, on the regional general permit that new dock standards, are those standards we've already adopted or we're contemplating adopting? Uh, they have been approved by the Harbor Commission and um, there, we've just had the building department um, finalize some um, minor changes to them and we'll be bringing them to the council for approval um, sometime in March. Okay. My last question is who, who gave us the uh, HAMP grant? Uh, Department of Water Resources of the State of California. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tom, what is the practical effect of having a disruption in the funding both on the upper bay and with the lower bay? If I heard correctly, we save about a million dollars in mobilization costs by being able to continue the project with uh, the equipment that's uh, currently uh, been deployed. But uh, let's assume that we are unsuccessful in continuing federal funding at the schedule that we needed for both of the projects. What, what does that do to us? One of the problems other than uh, the cost of mobilization and demobilization is um, timing of the project. Um, there are certain areas of the upper bay um, that are sensitive because of endangered species that um, we cannot dredge in those areas um, certain times of the year. So if if the schedule is disrupted, um, then it could be out of sync by many months. Um, the nesting season generally runs from March to September, and so that's quite a big chunk of the year that we would um, be out of sync in. Thank you. But couldn't uh, they be dredging in the lower bay if they could? there was a money available to where that would allow them to keep their equipment in use year-round almost. 
And that's our strategy is um, um, keep them working while they're here and uh, take care of all of the federal responsibility in the upper and lower bay. Okay, Councilman Moore Nichols, you had a question? Yeah, the question I had is the lower bay that you're particularly showing eelgrass areas, is that sand, that sand is still good though for use on the beaches and so forth? Yes, when we, um, back in 2003, um, dredge sand in the harbor entrance to remove the shoal in the entrance along the east jetty. We um, took uh, that about 43,000 cubic yards out and uh, dumped it in the near shore zone adjacent to uh, the West Newport groin field and it got washed up on shore and was beneficial to uh, replenishing the sand in West Newport. Would there be, a, I'm still looking for sand for Corona Del Mar Beach. <laughs> My question is, is, is the state any, uh, help any on that? I mean, that's part of the, is that, all, is that the responsibility of the city or the state for, and I'd like to get some of that that's coming right from the other side of our groins and so sure. forth, you know, I mean, sure. I hate to lose all of that at other places. An another project that I'm working on that I haven't updated you on yet is um, as um, part of the coastal development permit for Newport Coast, um, the uh, Coastal Commission required the Irvine Company to uh, deposit about $180,000 into a beach replenishment fund. I've been uh, in contact with um, Coastal Commission staff about uh, using that as uh, seed money for uh, a beach replenishment project at Big Corona. The money can be spent uh, from the East Jetty um, down to Abalone Point for any beach replenishment project. So certainly the eastern portion of Corona Del Mar Beach qualifies for that. Um, in addition, I've talked to the Department of Boating and Waterways who said that since it is a state beach operated by the city, um, that with that Coastal Commission seed money, they felt that they could contribute some money to um, a larger project um, on Corona Del Mar Beach. So we're working on it, but we're not there yet. Any other council members? Uh, uh, council just, members a, just a quick thought. Is there any, would there be any merit to the idea of the city having their own dredging equipment? Kind of like, you know, how they paint the bridge up in San Francisco. They start at one end and they paint it all the way and then they start over again. Right. I mean, is there any, I mean, obviously there's mobilization savings every time you mobilize and, and this and that. And maybe if we had our own equipment, a barge and a dredge that would just continually work in the bay and other areas that we have, obviously. I mean, is there any, was there ever been any thought for that or? Uh, there has been idea? some thought and, um, and there has been an interesting example that I've been following um, up in Santa Cruz Harbor mm -hmm. where uh, the Army Corps wanted to buy their way out of maintenance dredging in Santa Cruz Harbor. And um, so they bought um, the Harbor District a dredge, a tug, and a barge. Mm -hmm. And uh, they trained um, I think three staff members and, and provided uh, salary uh, for them for, I believe, 10 years. And um, now, 20 years later, the equipment is in great disrepair. The city feels that they really got the short side of the stick on that one and, and very much regret that they made the deal with the Army Corps. Um, mm. it's, it's a lot of upkeep um, and um, you, you really need to keep that equipment busy. Uh, the city of Long Beach also has their own dredge. Mm. And, um, and I've tried to um, negotiate with them to um, see if they'd be willing to, um, when I was with the county, dredge uh, Huntington Harbor for us um, because it's just around the corner outside their breakwater for right. them to bring their equipment in. And, and they had about six months of downtime for their equipment where they had their operators doing other things. And, um, and we could never come to terms because they didn't want to enter into a performance contract. They wanted a time and materials contract and 
and we of course wouldn't agree to that. So um, there's there's a lot of disadvantages in as municipalities owning their own equipment and keeping it busy because there's so much lead time in, in getting the permits and getting um, everything coordinated to keep staff working. Thank you. We did own a dredge at one time for the uh, the water department did to, to dredge silt out of the bottom of the Big Canyon Reservoir. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, I believe the next item on our agenda is dogs on the beach. Who's going to make that presentation? Lieutenant uh, Kaminsky from the police department. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the city council. If I could just have a minute, I need to load up a uh, CD for you. Okay. Uh, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council, uh, again, uh, good afternoon. I think it's, uh, it's important to uh, provide Council with some background on our uh, municipal ordinances that applies to animals uh, in general and dogs in specific on our uh, city beaches, uh, both oceanfront and bay beaches. Prior to 1989, our ordinance uh, prohibited animals and dogs uh, on uh, those beaches during the summer months between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And rough uh, summer months, roughly uh, June to September, uh, depending on when school let out and when school began again back in the fall. And uh, there was a lot of confusion on the part of the public, um, both residents and visitors who came down <coughs> as to when the prohibition existed. Was it summertime? Was it wintertime? And a lot of those residents received citations from animal control officers. Uh, council at the time uh, realized the confusion and uh, was driven by this to revise the ordinance and simplify it to what we have today post-1989. Uh, the current ordinance allows for uh, <coughs> prohibition of dogs between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. every day of the year. There is no uh, month or seasonal distinction on that prohibition at all. And I've attached to the staff report that you have the um, ordinance, and it, does, it's, it is not from 1989, it is 1996, which uh, struck other uh, elements of the ordinance, however, it does uh, state quite succinctly the, uh, the hours and when those uh, prohibitions exist. <clears throat> Prior to the revision, uh, before 1989, uh, we experienced some problems uh, during winter months when we had warm weather. Uh, we just had such a uh, period about three weeks ago here where temperatures reached uh, the 80s. Uh, the dogs, of course, Prior to 1989, in the wintertime, we're allowed on the beaches during the day between 9 and 5. And if you had uh, temperatures that, uh, you know, uh, compelled people to go to the beach, our beach population swelled. We had the dogs down there, complaints of uh, defecation, urination, uh, dog versus dog uh, incidents, dog versus human incidents rose. So uh, we had a little more of a patrol and control issue at that point. Uh, we, we still see that, uh, you know, like I said, about three weeks ago, we had some weather here that was uh, in the 80s. We had a heavy beach, day, heavy beach couple of days, and had that ordinance been in effect at that time or this time, we, st we would have seen the same problems, I'm sure. Uh, statistically speaking for our police department the, um, and the animal control unit, 46.2% uh, of all beach violations, animal beach violations, uh, Excuse me, let me, let me rephrase that. In 2005, animal beach violations accounted for 46.2 percent of all their site activity. Specifically regarding animals off leash and uh, animals on the beach during prohibited hours, animals off leash represented 23.3 percent or almost a quarter of their site activity, and 19.9 percent .9 uh, were uh, animals uh, prohibited uh, on the beach during prohibited hours, almost 20 percent. I did a uh, survey of uh, our coastal cities uh, and their uh, prohibitions or lack thereof of animals on the beaches, and it's also included in the staff report. Uh, 
Dana Point, San Clemente, Seal Beach, and Huntington Beach uh, have a complete prohibition of animals on the beaches uh, all the time. Now, I've uh, footnoted Huntington Beach because, as you're uh, well aware, they have a section of beach that is uh, known as Dog Beach, and I have a, a PowerPoint demonstration if I could uh, sure, go ahead. light that up for you. On the screen is a uh, aerial photo of uh, Dog Beach, and it reaches from Sea Point Avenue to the north there, uh, one mile, approximately one mile to the south to 21st Street, uh, Coast Highway, of course, uh, bordering the ocean. And uh, this area of beach is Huntington uh, City. Uh, it allows dogs off leash. However, there is no statutory exception in their ordinance for dogs to be off leash here. Important thing to remember about this beach is that it's quite different than uh, our beaches in Newport Beach. We don't ha uh, here we don't have any uh, residential. Well, we have about 50 yards of residential area. There's uh, above Coast Highway uh, 20 to 30 foot bluffs. Beyond the Coast Highway, there's an old oil field, and on top of those bluffs, there's parking lots, and that's it. There's three entrances to uh, get onto the Dog Beach. On the weekends, the entrances are manned by volunteers of the Dog Beach Association. Uh, they are there to make sure. They're kind of like uh, overseers of the beach, and they hand out uh, dog bags, dog waste bags, et cetera, answer any questions that uh, beachgoers may have. This is a sign uh, at the Dog Beach. Uh, you, you can see that. Um, the first little bullet there says keep your dog on a leash. Again, there's no statutory exemption at this beach. However, um, we'll see in a video here in a minute, the dogs do run free down there. This is another sign that I found uh, interesting. It's a uh, sign that uh, allows you to sign up for some free uh, pet liability insurance. And that indicates to me that they've had issues down there relative to possibly dog bites, fights, et cetera. Jim, are we assuming then that they don't cite for dogs off leash there? The, um, Huntington, the city of Huntington Beach contracts with the Orange County Animal Control Authority to do all their animal services. I contacted them uh, in Orange County states that they will not go down there and even enforce this portion of the beach unless called to in a very rare circumstance by the Huntington Beach Police Department. This is a city of Huntington Beach sign. It uh, prohibits certain acts. Number uh, two, dogs not restrained by a six-foot leash. Another city of Huntington Beach sign. This is all at the uh, dog uh, beach that we showed on the uh, aerial. Uh, the first one, dogs must be on a six-foot leash, and dogs must pick up, or dog owners must pick up after their, uh, their pets. And then, uh, you know, this gets into some, uh, I, these photos were taken by an animal control officer, and uh, there are some pictures here that I, I try to keep them to a minimum, but they're a bit, of, a bit offensive. Some dog waste, this is what we found down at the, uh, the Huntington Beach. I, uh, we also had a video that was taken by an animal control officer uh, this past Saturday uh, in this area of the Dog Beach. And I understand that the council uh, is, may not be uh, interested in having a full uh, free leash beach here in the city. However, it, uh, it is illustrative of uh, some of the problems that you may encounter down at the Dog Beach in Huntington Beach. And we can play the video here. And again, I apologize, this was a uh, video that was shot by an animal control officer uh, he, who had some problems with his focus on it, so it does go in and out of focus, but I think uh, you'll get the message. And there is no sound to this. Now, the dogs, um, by rule, if you will, are supposed to only be off leash at the wet sand line and leashed on the dry sand line. So as you're watching, you can clearly see, and I've seen it uh, myself personally, as soon as the dog's at the top of the bluff, the leash comes off and we're off to the races. I think it's important. On this day, this is, a, uh, sat uh, this is last Saturday, as a matter of fact, and I'm sure you're well aware of the weather conditions on that day. It was uh, hazy sunshine. 
uh, kind of breezy, uh, not cool, but not warm day either. There's about, uh, I'm told by the officer that shot, there's 75 to 100 animals on the beach. Dry sand area again. This is a good shot of what the beach looks like with the animals and people present. Again, this is winter time. People taking the leash off right there at the, uh, the foot of the bluff. The excretia problems again. These are the signs that we uh, took the stills of before uh, depicting no dogs uh, off the leash and then again uh, picking up after your pet. dry sand area. So in the interest of time, the, the, uh, the tape goes on for uh, nine minutes, I think. That, uh, yeah, we don't need nine minutes of it. Council, <laughs> council gets the message here. Yes. Okay. The, um, obviously we have environmental concerns for our beaches uh, with the, the dog waste. Uh, citizens are easily monitored. Uh, we can pick up uh, or watch them and enforce picking up solid waste. The liquid waste, impossible to monitor. How much is going into the sand? It's impossible to pick up. When the animal has the urge, it's, you know, it's going to go, whether it's on the beach or, or wherever. And usually they do it on the beach because it's, uh, you know, a housebroken animal usually, and it's not going to go in the house. Uh, the other environmental concern is the, uh, the snowy plover, and Council is well aware of the, uh, the habitats and issues concerning the snowy plover. Now. The ordinance that uh, it, the revised or unrevised is not going to affect animals disturbing the snowy plover. If a dog goes onto the beach in a dune area and the snowy plover is uh, nesting there, it's going to disturb it. However, it is interesting to note that in May, which would be before the winter time or the summertime restrictions, that is the nesting period of the, or that's when the, the snowy plovers lay their eggs. So that's, it's a more sensitive time. So, you know, prior to uh, 1989, we had an ordinance that allowed dogs on the beach during the daytime, during nesting time. Uh, Huntington Beach is the only other city besides Newport Beach that allows dogs and other animals on the beach uh, during or prohibits them during summer months. They have an ordinance that is very, very similar, almost identical to the one we had prior to 1989, with the exception of one hour. They allow or prohibit. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Laguna Beach. I probably did. Uh, Laguna Beach uh, prohibits the uh, animals on the beach during the summertime, again, June to September, or roughly the school schedule, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. I called uh, Laguna Beach. I talked with one of their um, elder uh, animal control officers, Joyce Falk. Uh, she, she says that they, uh, they have similar problems that uh, we had uh, when prior to the revision of our ordinance. They have uh, a contentious relationship, as she calls it, between people who live on the bluffs above Laguna Beach and the dog owners who like to have their uh, dogs run free or at least on a leash at that point. Uh, it got to the point where uh, this particular animal control officer is responsible for the creation of the dog park in uh, Laguna Canyon. Uh, she um, also told me that uh, the, their citizens uh, have similar uh, confusion about 
you know, what months you can have the dog out there during the daytime, what months you can't have them out during the daytime. They have the excretia uh, uh, problems. They cite about uh, 12 people a year for um, leaving dog waste on the beach. And it sounds like a low number. I asked her why it's such a low number. And they, have, uh, they are very, very careful to follow uh, their code in such a way that they don't want anything, um, any tickets lost in court. They actually watch the, the dog, you know, lay the waste, if you will. They watch the owner walk away, maybe make a, uh, you know, uh, an action where he's looking around, has a dog waste bag in his hand but doesn't use it. They want th that type of evidence. If, if they don't have that, they don't write the citation. They write a warning. Um, they've had approximately 20 uh, dog versus dog attacks or dog versus human attacks in Laguna Beach also. So it's a comparison that um, I wanted to make. They had an or we had an ordinance very similar to this, like I said, with the exception of one hour. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Council, uh, any questions? Mr. Rosansky. We, we don't have any video of the Laguna Beach, though, do we? No, sir. Okay. <laughs> and we don't ban the dogs in our parks, do we? No. And um, we potentially would have this. There are some parks that, uh, I guess, parks that are adjacent to uh, school grounds. Right. Dogs and are banned. Okay. Yes, sir. And Laguna but also bans them from their uh, play equipment on beaches or near beaches. Okay. So we have the same, I guess, issue with dog excrement or dog off leash in, in parks and other places. I mean, these people are walking their dogs somewhere. They're going to the yeah. bathroom somewhere unless they're keeping them all locked in their house. I mean, yes. so, and our previous law did not allow the dogs off the leash. That's correct. Okay. Um, and, and we do permit dogs on the beach after 5 and before 9. That is correct. In the winter every, month. Or every day of the year. Every day of the year. So, if, I mean, if excrement and leash problems, I mean, then we probably should be banning it all year round, I would imagine. Yeah, and, and council at the time wanted to uh, provide for a, a cleaner atmosphere during the day when, when, when most of the people frequented the beach. That's why they... Uh, well, the, the dog excrement doesn't walk away. Well, I, I know that. But <laughs> on its own. It's, it's more, I, I guess it's more offensive when somebody's laying on the beach and it happens in front of them. I see. Well, I guess I, I don't really have any more questions. I mean, so in your opinion, this is an undesirable thing for our beaches. Is, that, think, is that the point of view? I think with, what Council's intention was back in 1989 was to simplify this ordinance and to prohibit dogs on the beach during the daytime hours every day of the year. Because prior to 1989, we allowed them during the winter time between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. I, I remember. Okay. We had problems on warm days where we still had people on the beach. We had lots of people on the beach, even when the beach was, you know, uh, partially or on a uh, kind of a cool winter day. We still had people on the most popular beaches at Corona del Mar, at the West Ocean Front Lot. Yeah, granted those yeah. days that, I mean, and, that people that go was, to the beach. I, I believe that was the intent of council at the time, just to uh, limit the, the number of animals on the beach to when people, the most people will not be there. I see. Anybody else have any uh, comments or questions on this? Well, if uh, if anybody's looking for a correction, I support the police department and prior council's actions. I think it's appropriate. Uh, I know the chief and Officer or Lieutenant Kaminsky and myself have had correspondence in the past since I uh, represent the peninsula, and I think it's a fine policy, or I think it's a fine ordinance as currently written. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Sillage. Yeah, just as a point of information, the, uh, the Balboa Island Improvement Association is going to be sending the uh, City Council a letter requesting that dogs be prohibited on the beaches at all times on the beaches on Balboa Island. They just feel that the beaches are too small and, uh, and the, uh, I guess the density of dogs, if you will, causes a lot of problems out there. So just, just to let you know that will be coming. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, I was simply going to say that I echo uh, Council uh, Member Ridgeway's comments. I think it's an excellent presentation on documenting uh, the effect of this ordinance, and I certainly see that the status quo is a, it's a fine ordinance and should stay in place. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item on our agenda is
insurance renewals. Mr. Mayor, we have three items uh, on the regular agenda tonight, but we thought it would be a good opportunity since timing is very important here in order to get new policies into effect to provide uh, an overview of the uh, three items on the agenda at study session. So Barbara Ramsey, who is the HR director, will start us out, and Lauren Farley, our risk manager, is also a part of the presentation. Okay, well, I, I kind of hate to follow those cute little puppy dogs because this is kind of a boring subject, but we're going to make excuse, it interesting. Excuse me for, excuse me for just okay. one minute. I made an error again. Uh, we I didn't ask for public comments on the dog issue. So let's back up. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll start again. I'm sorry to do this to you. Was there somebody like to comment on the, the dog issue? I apologize for overlooking that. Mayor Webb and Council, my name is John Cunningham. I am uh, here actually at the request of Al Shonk, who's the president of the Double Island Improvement Association, but couldn't be here tonight. The principal thing that I was going to talk about is what Councilman Selich has just stated, which was that by somewhat of a coincidence at our meeting last Thursday night, 23rd, I believe it was, uh, by unanimous vote, the Board of Directors of the Balboa Island Improvement Association instructed the President to send to you people a letter requesting that if there's going to be some changes of some kind in the uh, in the dogs on the beach situation that uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, dogs be prohibited from Balboa Island beaches. We feel that they are very unique as opposed to the ocean beaches, which are 50, 100 yards wide, totally different state of affairs. Uh, the My observation, we live on uh, the East Bay front on Little Balboa Island, and we see, spend a lot of time sitting out in the front drinking coffee and watching the sun come up and so forth. And the a big, big problem there, very candidly, is a lack of enforcement of the rules as they exist today. Dogs are running all over the beaches. Uh, six foot leash is a laugh. Fifty percent of the people walking their dogs on the on the uh, walkway, I, I would estimate, have 25 or 30 foot roll up leashes. Uh, that's another another issue. But I, my principal reason in being here was to advise you, as I said, that the uh, board of directors of Balboa Island Improvement Association feels very strongly that we don't want dogs. Period. On the beaches there, they're unique. They're they're much smaller than the beaches on the ocean beaches, and uh, a letter is going to be coming to you requesting just that. Okay. There are, <laughs> I, took, I took as recently as this morning some pictures of, uh, of some of the old instruction, uh, uh, whatever they are, the rules, rules and regulations about what you can have on the beach, no alcohol, no uh, picnics, no, no dogs, and the old ones, Apparently, my, prior to 1989, said amongst all these other no, no, no's, no dogs. So at any rate, that's all I have to say. But we feel very strongly on Balboa Island that we do not wish to have dogs. Period on the beaches. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions of, the, of John? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you. Just a comment. You understand this is a study session. We take no action. But send your letter, okay? It'll be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Barbara, I'm sorry to have to interrupt you, but... Uh, that's okay. The dogs come first, right? No, that's <laughs> okay. That, they're so cute. Keep you on short leash. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, for those of you that I've not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Barbara Ramsey. I'm the new hu Human Resources Director. I've been here for approximately seven months, but I've brought two experts with me on this issue. I've brought Mark Zahorian. He is our broker from Brown and & Brown, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about the process on renewing our insurances. And Lauren Farley, who's been with the Human Resources Department for 12 years, who has been coming to you every year with these renewals. We do do this every year, but we thought it would be a good idea to kind of let you know what the process is we go through, because it's pretty extensive. There's a lot of background, and it's a pretty costly budget item, so we wanted to kind of explain it to you. We have three items on the agenda today. Uh, they're on the consent item 8, 9, and 10. The first one is general liability, and basically we're self-insured for general liability up to 
$500,000 and then up to a million dollars for um, employment practices to a maximum of $26 million. So we pay for that insurance, we pay for everything that's below that, that's within the SIR ourselves. Then the second item on the agenda is the workers' comp excess. We also are self-insured for workers' compensation and we pay all claims. We have an SIR up to a million dollars. So the insurance only kicks in after a million dollars per claim. The third item is all of the property that we own in Newport Beach and you have a, there's a list, there's a chart behind telling which insurance we have for which properties. It's a little bit different this year. We have added the Mariner's Library and we have combined a couple of insurances with the peers that Mark will talk to you a little bit about. He's negotiated that. So as I said before, although we bring this every year, there's a lot of negotiations and thing, the things that go on uh, to bring you the best coverage for the least cost. And I've met with Mark several times this year just since I've been here and I feel real confident that he does get us the best price and, and the best insurance and that he really knows his business. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Mark. You have an agenda in front of you that he prepared on the things he's going to talk about. And then after that, Lauren's going to follow up with any uh, details on the memos or answer any questions that you may have. With that, I'll turn the time over to Mark. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Mark Sahorian, Senior Vice President for Brown and & Brown. And since the last time I approached the council, there are two new members. I wanted to give a brief overview of who Brown & Brown is. We're a publicly traded company. We have 150 locations in about 33 states. We're the eighth largest broker in the United States and ninth in the, uh, in the world. And I've been with uh, Brown & Brown, as I mentioned, 22 years. But more importantly, I've been the broker for the city for over 15 years. So I feel I know the city very well. Um, and through that, the presentation I would like to give you uh, this afternoon is a brief overview. The intent is to give you a brief overview of we, what we go through every year to negotiate insurance for the city. The marketing process, we start approximately 120 days gathering statistical underwriting information. That's basically updating your property schedules updating applications for various insurance companies and identifying any significant changes or exposures that the city may have during that last year period. That would be more helpful for the council also to understand what the exposures are and also to implement the program. Approximately December, we started the submission process. We do that typically 90 days um, before renewal, and we go to the various companies. Now, when I say go to, we do not just send written submissions out to carriers. We have face-to-face -face meetings and really identify who the players are and what we need to do to entice other players to really come to the table and look at the insurance program for the city. In January, typically, what I do 45 days before the actual process, I come in and I talk to staff and really identify where we're at in the marketplace, where I originally thought we were going to be, and where in actuality where we're going to be as far as the insurance program. And then the week of February 6, typically uh, we go out three weeks roughly uh, before renewal and go to the key players that we know are going to be the bottom line markets we're going to go with. And I do that so staff meets the underwriters and if we have any additional room for premium reductions, we typically accomplish it in those meetings. Face-to-face -face interaction with the underwriters by staff is very helpful in the, those final negotiation stages. Now, market conditions. Every year the market conditions are really different. And this year we had a combination of stable and unstable markets. And the general liability is a very stable uh, market right now. For all practical purposes, we were expecting a flat rate and premium to a slight uh, increase. 
Excess workers' compensation, a little different. It's, it's different for private industry than it is for municipalities. Private industry, we're seeing greater reductions in rate than we do in cities. Cities, the primary reason is because the catastrophic exposure, concentration of employees in various facilities. Um, and because of Katrina, uh, insurance companies and reinsurers are very sensitive to that catastrophic loss. So with, with the workers' comp, I was expecting basically a flat to a 10% uh, decrease in rate. Now, when I discuss rate, it's rate per exposure, not necessarily premium, and I'll show the differentiation later on. <coughs> Property insurance, I'm basically dividing it into two areas. Our master property policy, excluding the peers and without the coverage for earthquake and flood, we're expecting, did expect, basically a flat rate on that. The market is pretty stable when it comes to that area of property. The next area where we needed to make some improvements, where I was very concerned, was the earthquake and flood program overall, and including the overall program for the peers. What is happening when I mention Katrina? The catastrophic loss and what occurred in the South caused a lot of pain for not only insurance companies, but reinsurers. And what that means is, when dealing with catastrophic loss, the insurance companies want to make sure they really have sufficient funds to overcome a situation like what happened in the South. So with that, we were seeing increases in January from 15 to 25 percent. And I was really concerned because we have a high concentration of risk. Also, because of the peers, the issue of flood and wave wash concerned many insurers and underwriters. Going to item four, market conditions, ex, um, expectations really reflect how I choose the markets and where we go to. Excess general liability, we have a very, very exceptional rate. We've been with the uh, insurance company of State of the Pennsylvania for three years now, going on our fourth year. Extremely competitive in the marketplace. 120 days out, I determined there were no other key players that were going to make a significant difference in rate. So then our energies really went to the excess workers' comp and the property. Excess workers' comp, even though I knew I was going to get a reduction, I wanted to take advantage of the leveraging of markets, and I went to six key markets that play in this area. Now, as we all know, there are hundreds of carriers that do business and workers' compensation in the state of California, not for cities. So the markets that we went to, day in and day out, write coverage for workers' compensation for cities. When it was all said and done, the reflection or decrease that we got was really due to that marketing uh, procedure and really going and leveraging what other carriers could do for us. The property, because of the uh, uh, increase that I was expecting, I went to 15 markets. I went to all of them and met with many of them. There were a few I didn't meet with because I knew they were going to be wild cards. They typically work on a very lower um, a level of coverage, but I still didn't want to leave them out. And after that whole process came our results. And I was very pleased with the results because the premium on the excess liability came in exactly what we thought. The insurance company first had a slight increase in premium over last year, and it was due to an increase in exposure, your exposure base for liabilities population. Explain to them 3,000 different, you know, more people in the city of Newport Beach. Give me a break. Do not increase the premium. They agreed, so we kept the premium flat. Excess workers' comp, we uh, obtained a slight decrease um, in premium after an 8% increase in payroll. So a slight decrease in actual premium. What that means is an effectively a 9% rate reduction. 
So I was very pleased with that and the exceeded staff's expectations and my own expect expectations also. As far as property, bottom line is we had a 12% premium increase. When it's all said and done, it's, it's, it's very complicated, but the actual rate increase was approximately 7.7%, call it 8%. So, and most of that was due to the effect on DIC. The sole reason why we were able to keep that in line and not the 15, 20, 25% increase that I originally expected was to how we now ensure, if you approve, the peers. Before, we had various carriers on what I call the special risk, which would be fire, all risk except for earthquake and flood, and incorporated the earthquake and flood into this new program and incorporated uh, the wave wash also. So with all that, from what we expected in premium, it came in at about $45,000 lower or really about the same premium we paid last year. That means we have to change carriers, which is still a very strong carrier, but that is my recommendation and that's why we were able to keep the premiums where we did. With that, any questions? Does council have any questions? Uh, Mr. Curry? Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mark, you noted the reduction in our workers' comp uh, premium. How much of that do you believe is attributable to the reforms the governor Im implemented a couple of years ago in this area? I would say overall industry-wide it had a significant effect, it really did, because it really set, set the stage and gave the insurance companies opportunities to legitimately go in and lower the premiums. Um, so as it affects the city's workers' comp, it, it, it had an impact. And, and to ask the question sort of uh, in a mirror image, as you're aware there's efforts afoot in Sacramento to undo some of those reforms, is it likely that if those are successful that that would result in an increased premium uh, to the city? If I had a crystal ball, I could, I could probably answer it better. In my personal opinion, I say not for the next 24 to 36 months. What's going to happen is since the insurance industry has, and in underwriting, has basically uh, chose their position and if they have underwriting results that can support that, meaning loss ratios that are within line of their own profitability as a company, they're going to keep their rating the same. Mm -hmm. um, if those changes basically cause increases in claims and increases in payouts, that's when you're going to get a change and you're going to get increases. Okay. And then one last question. We're retaining a million dollars of retainage, I guess, or of liability. How does that compare with other uh, comparable cities? In, on workers' comp? Well, on, on all of these, I think in our liability, we've got quite about a million dollars of retained self-insurance. Uh, on liability, it's 500000 with okay. the exception of employment practices liability. For the most part, for a city your size, it's very comparable. Smaller cities have, we insure some cities that have a $50,000 uh, retention on liability and probably have a 50, I would say between 50 to 350,000 retention on workers' comp. But again, it's much smaller cities. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, for a city your size, mm -hmm. this is definitely in line. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? I might Mr. give. Mr. Mayor. Okay, okay, Mr. Sellage. <clears throat> Maybe you're not the person to answer it. Maybe it's one of the staff. But um, what do we typically pay out in worker comp claims in a year? Or maybe, maybe it isn't typical. Maybe there's some big ones and small ones. Well, um, there's no typical year um, to per se. Um, and for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Lauren Farley. I'm the risk manager. Um, on workers' compensation, um, last year we paid about for the claims that were filed in that fiscal year. Um, we paid about $980,000. Um, that doesn't take into account 
those claims from prior years that we're still paying on. Mm. So, um, is that a typical year or a big year or a small year? It's it's about it's about average for us. It's about average. We um, have um, claim wise. I was going to ask you, how many claims does that translate into? Um, in 0405 fiscal year, we had 147 claims. Um, we range between about 125 to 100 and, you know, 60. Um, sometimes uh, an employee may file multiple claims, um, multiple body parts. That will get a master file. Um, but it still can count as additional claims for those body parts depending on the on the uh, nature of the injury. Currently, we have 112 claims in this fiscal year. So 0506, at the end of January, we've um, filed 112 claims. Now, that varies depending on the demographics of our employee population. Um, it certainly varies within our safety population, our police and fire. And um, it can vary depending on uh, whether or not we have multiple claims arising from one incident. If we have a lot of employees that, um, let's say, a fire or a police action, that could change that mix as well. Do they typically mostly come from the safety employees versus the operational employees? The three operating centers we get most of our um, claims from are police, fire, and general services. We have some from utilities. Um, an occasional claim coming from recreation and an occasional claim coming from administrative um, departments, um, you know, like administrative services or um, we never had a claim from the city clerk. Didn't want to call her out. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so mostly from the administrative type uh, office jobs, we typically get very few. Okay, thank you. Lauren Art. Am I right in saying that some of those claims don't result in any lost work time and don't result result in any uh, workers' comp being paid out to those employees? Um, typically, uh, we'll have two different type of claims. We'll have medical-only claims where the employee goes for medical treatment only, doesn't have any time lost from work, uh, for example, has some stitches, a laceration, um, cutting open a box of materials or something. They get a couple stitches and they're back at work and they don't have any time loss. Um, most of our time loss cases, unless it's catastrophic, meaning greater than six months, are typical time loss cases within the five to 10 week period. So, and those do happen with those class, job classifications that have um, more opportunity for physical activity. In general services in particular, our refuse division, they're throwing trash all day long. Um, that's pr probably one of the heaviest jobs we have in the city. Um, not to take anything away from police and fire, but that they're doing that day in and day out. So, okay. Uh, I might remind the council that uh, items eight, nine, and ten on the consent calendar are the items that we're discussing right now. So, if you have any questions uh, that you might ask tonight, uh, you might get the answer to earlier and uh, leave it on the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anybody from the public that would like to talk about this? Seeing no one. Oh, That's right. Uh, does the council have any, any other questions related to insurance? Okay. Then right. thank you very much for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Council member Rosansky and Nichols came in after we talked about the clarifications of item on the consent calendar. Do either one of you have any items you need to have clarified? None, thank you. Mr. Nichols? Good. Uh, public comments are invited uh, non-agenda items. I see no one wishing to do that, so uh, we are adjourned until the regular meeting at 7.